Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, please join me in, in welcoming our speaker for today. Uh, we have a very distinguished professor with us and uh, two distinguished professors with us, one at Priya and uh, one joining us from Delhi. Uh, I'd like to uh, welcome Professor Sachitan and Sinha and uh, who will be uh, speaking today uh, Professor Sinha, you have, uh, you're actually addressing uh, people at CLIA, both faculty, postdoctoral scholars, a number of students from the Social Studies and History and Politics Methods course. Um, and uh, Professor Nazifa and I are here and uh, we are coordinating this session. Uh, thank you so much for making the time to be with us today. Um, I'm just going to introduce uh, Professor Sinha and Professor Mohapatra very briefly and the subject of the talk today. So, Professor Sinha will be talking to us about From Worldview to Public Policy, Searching for Evidence in Social Sciences. Professor Sachidan and Sinha serve as a Professor of Social Geography and Regional Development at the Center for the Study of Regional Development at the Jawaharlal Nehru University in New Delhi. His area of teaching and research includes development and access to educational and health services, particularly concerning socially and economically marginalized groups, women, and the physically challenged in India. He has been actively engaged with central and state governments as well as civil society organizations. He was a member of the 11th plan of the UGC and served as an advisor to the Punjab Governance Reforms Commission in 2016-17. He prepared a report for the Cape Committee on Pathways to Improving Public Schools in India. Additionally, he has been on the editorial boards of several international journals. Please uh, join me in welcoming Professor Sina. We have uh, as a moderator for today, Professor Vishnu Mohapatra. I will, I will go ahead and introduce him. Uh, Professor Vishnu Mohapatra is a political scientist and poet, an educator, and a commentator on society, governance, policy, and culture. He has taught politics for more than 25 years at the University of Delhi, Jamalal Nehru University, and Azim Premji University. He is Currently, the director of the Motivi Satyanarayana Center for at Kriya and professor of political science at Kriya. So, thank you very much um, to both Professor Vishnu and Professor Sinha for doing this for us. And I will just turn this over to Professor Sinha now. Well, uh, the topic, and I have 45 minutes if I'm not wrong. I have 45 minutes to yeah. now, so it's already 2.41. So I think, you know, by about 3.15 or 3.30, I should be done with my presentation. Uh, the topic uh, that I was asked to uh, speak on was uh, pertaining to uh, the sources of social and economic data sets, particularly the secondary data sets. And I thought, you know, since it's a very talking about data becomes very, very dry. So why not uh, link it with the question of how um, we in India at several stages in the course of the making of this country, uh, the public policy has shaped and whether and to what extent, you know, there has been uh, the contribution from uh, the data which was generated uh, earlier by the colonial government and later after 1947, you know, what were the important steps that were taken in order to strengthen uh, information pertaining to various aspects of social and economic life, India's population. India is a very, very vast country, we all know. But before I talk about the data sets, let me start with an anecdote, a couple of anecdotes that will contextualize as to how 
you know, we as individuals or groups of people, you know, sometimes uh, are very often take recourse to our, uh, the worldview that we have, uh, we have or we have uh, acquired through the process of socialization and experiences in our own lives. Say, for example, you know, uh, I remember when I was a student and I had to return to JNU on a certain day because that's the day by which, you know, you must complete your registration. Vishnu knows it very well. All of you sitting in the audience would also understand that there is a last date. And uh, since, you know, you are visiting home, you would like to take maximum time, spend, uh, you'd like to spend maximum time with your parents. And it so happened that I had booked my return ticket on a certain day. Uh, when I told my father that I'm leaving on such and such, and such date, he looked at the calendar and he said, that's not the right day to go in that direction. I said, why? I mean, in Bihar, since I hail from Bihar, you know, there is some kind of a notion, some kind of a uh, view that prevails. Uh, and it continues to, continues to prevail even today. Is that, you know, taking a, a journey in a particular direction on a certain day of a week is not very auspicious. Now, if I were to perhaps not undertake that journey, then booking another ticket those days when I was, say, about 40, 40 years back, it would have been extremely difficult for me to get another reservation. So I insisted. And I told there are several trains which are moving in that direction. So there are several buses which are moving in that, in that direction. Nothing is happening to anybody. So where is the, where, what makes you feel? I asked my father, what makes you feel that it is unsafe? Well, he couldn't really say much. He said, you know, this is how I have been following. And he himself was a professor of, of commerce and a very reputed person in his own right. Uh, and there was yet another occasion, and that was relatively recent when I think Vishnu and I were neighbors um, as, as wardens in the same hostel. Uh, I had gone to Japan and I was to return on a certain day, and uh, I had a leave from the university which said that, you know, you can take leave maximum of 14 days in a semester. And the date for which I had booked my return ticket was, was on the 18th day. It meant that if I were to take that journey on the 18th day, I would have lost the, there would have been, that would have accounted for, uh, accounted to be a break in service. So I had to prepone my ticket. And the only day that the ticket was available from there was on a Friday. And that Friday was Friday, Friday the 13th. And I was amazed to find that there were very few people at the airport when I was taking my journey back home. So it's not only in India that we have certain kind of a notion, a certain kind of a worldview, but it could also be there elsewhere. Um, and Japan not being particularly a Christian country, but nevertheless, you know, there were very few passengers at the airport on a certain day. And that was not many, many years ago. Similarly, you know, if one were to perhaps take a recourse to what is really happening to certain uh, decisions which have, which have been taken recently by our government. Say, for example, you know, I, I came to uh, know about a particular memorandum which has been issued by the National um, uh, Highway Authority of India that, uh, you know, because of accidents on the highway, which in fact is, is a fact, 60% of all accidents take place on highways. And uh, this is not a very strange phenomenon, although accidents are not to be, are not to be appreciated. And all the steps should be taken in order to, in fact, uh, reduce the number of accidents which take place. It cannot perhaps be entirely avoided. 
But the moment, you know, this, and this was not many, many months ago, this was just about two months ago that this notification was issued by the Ministry of Surface Transport. And I was in the hills of uh, Uttarakhand. I was traveling on a particular day. And I found that, you know, number of establishments, basically commercial establishments along the highway were already being demolished. It meant that all these people who had, who were earning some kind of an income from, and they're looking after their family, were suddenly, you know, out of job. I mean, they were on the, in the streets. Since I stayed there for some days, you know, I really found out as to what was the situation that was happening. They said, you know, these are unauthorized occupations. These are unauthorized, illegal occupations, and therefore they have to be removed. Fine. But, you know, at what cost? So that is where, you know, one has to perhaps take a look at as to how public policy, in the absence of any strong evidence as to how these establishments contribute to, you know, making the accidents happen. This could be true. This may not be true. But if one were to perhaps estimate it, and somebody has estimated recently, that close to about two crores of such establishments are likely to be demolished. Now, if one were to perhaps, you know, multiply two crores into five, into two, because, you know, if each establishment had an average of about two to four people working in those establishments, you know, you can just imagine the magnitude of people who would be out of job. This could be a good step, but, you know, relocating you know, the service centers all along the highways, which in fact, in US it is called the rest areas. And in India also, you know, this trend has already begun in certain parts of um, Punjab, in certain parts of Maharashtra, where you have, the, especially on the Pune, Mumbai highways. Now this could be a very good opportunity to reallocate spaces where some of these establishments could perhaps start their businesses once again. But when, but when you have a situation where, you know, you know, these spaces are going to be auctioned at a heavy price, many of such establishments or people who are running these establishments will be rendered out of job and they cannot really compete with, you know, the bidders who may be multinational bidders Say, for example, you know, we have already seen, I mean, I, I, I travel very frequently to Uttarakhand and I see that all such eating places, I mean, they continue, but at the same time, you know, you have such rest areas or such complexes where you have the McDonald's and, you know, people who can perhaps bid higher rental value, uh, they have taken over. Now, this cannot be entirely avoided, but you need to have some kind of a public policy based on, you know, the data sets, you know, that government generates or whether there is any data set at all. On the question of economic enterprises, uh, we have a variety of sources of data. I mean, I'm starting with the economic ones because Finally, I'll come to the social and cultural indicators, which perhaps may interest the students of social sciences. Uh, but if you look at the economic enterprises, you know, we have, we have plenty of data. We have data from the economic censuses. Unfortunately, the economic census, which in fact was considered to be a very, very important input into the five-year plans, uh, they have uh, not been found to be so favorable, especially after the sixth economic census for which the data is available. The economic census provides us data about all such array of establishments, big or small, at the district level. 
not only in terms of the capital which has been invested, the fixed capital and so on and so forth, but also the number of employees working in these various establishments. They account for the owned enterprises, household enterprises, and so on and so forth. So any kind of a commercial enterprise, production enterprise, service enterprises, they all are covered by economic census. The last that we had was the sixth one. The seventh one, which perhaps you know, was to give us data for the period 2017-18, uh, is partially done. The data has been withheld for whatever reason that we I really do not know. Uh, the eighth one has already started. I mean, the, there is a proposal that they are going to start the eighth economic census. But look at the fact that, you know, after 2013 14, that was the reference period of the sixth survey, sixth census. And when I'm talking about the census, I'm talking about the complete data on all kinds of enterprises. It's not a sample survey. Every village, every urban area, every locality is detailed, is surveyed in a very, very detailed manner on employment, on capital invested, and so on and so forth, on credit, and so on and so forth, and which, in fact, is very important for understanding the economic um, processes, economic issues of India, and also of the state governments, because you know they have they provide us information right up to the district level. We have uh, similarly, you know, to supplement this economic census, which is a periodical data set, we also have fairly large number of data sets, which in fact are provided by the National Sample Survey Organ Office, NSSO. You must have, some of you must have heard about it. There was some controversy going around after 1914, uh, particularly when it, the employment unemployment data was, uh, the employment unemployment rounds of the NSSO was replaced by PLFS, that is called Periodic Labor Force Survey, which is a welcome addition, but the PLFS, is an annual event. Every year the data is being generated. And uh, the employment and employment was initially considered to be a quinquennial, that means a five yearly kind of a report, a much more detailed one. And five year period was considered to be a fairly good amount of time, which would perhaps tell us as to what is the change occurring in the employment and employment situation. To supplement this, you know, there are also enterprises level survey. I mean, so economic census enterprise level survey can further be supplemented by information that the NSSO used to generate on unorganized enterprises. So this is yet another important venue. When, you know, all these practices which in fact the NSSO was engaged in periodically and on a regular basis is discontinued and there is no justification provided as to why they have been discontinued, then it raises the question as to how we go about you know, planning, how we go about uh, making public policy, policies about production, policies about industries, policies about employment and so so on and so forth. And that is what raises the question about why Planning Commission was perhaps replaced by Niti Ayo. Well, I do understand that without policy, there cannot be justice. But without data, there cannot be any policy. And therefore, it becomes very, very important for us to in fact look at as to what data sets are available other than these, which in fact throw enormous amount of light uh, and, and they provide enormous contribution to, uh, the, uh, to the making of public policy. Unfortunately, because of the COVID, one of the most important sources of, of data, which in fact pertains to the demographic 
and social economic data, uh, which was due in 2021. The census, the population census, as it is popularly known as, has not yet begun. In fact, there were doubts even before that. I mean, since I work on census-related issues, uh, I found that even in 2019 or prior to 2019, when house listing process should have been completed, that process was still going on and there was absolutely no indication that it was going to be concluded by 2020. So therefore, you know, I mean, I'm not doubting the intentions of the government, but the fact that we have missed the, 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 the decadal census we do not have any data about the size and about the composition of India's population and the kind of, and the, the range of information that used to be provided, you know, since it was a census and not a sample survey, from the general population tables to uh, the economic tables to the socio-cultural tables, age tables on marriages, on divorce, on the status of migrant population, the migration tables, the fertility. You know, when it comes to the question, like somebody raises the question as to, um, well, uh, why is the fertility rates among Muslims higher than that, those of the Hindus? You know, this whether this question is the correct question or it has to be seen as to why certain segments of population tend to have higher fertility rates than the others. If one would perhaps ask the second question, then, then immediately, you know, the answer would be that there are variety of social and economic factors which govern fertility than perhaps religious affiliations. One can see that, but perhaps, you know, our worldview is such that Muslims are allowed to have for marriages and so on and so forth. Uh, although whether the data supports it or not, uh, having four marriages does not really lead to having many, many children because men do not bear children. It's women who bear children. And therefore the best way to looking at this would be TFR, the total fertility rates. And the total fertility, ra fertility rates, if you look at the total fertility rates, then you know the difference between say the Hindus and the Muslims between various seg the segments of the population tends to vary. You have Muslims in Kerala who have much lower total fertility rates than perhaps uh, the Hindus of Uttar Pradesh or Bihar. So to what extent perhaps you know this impression that we generally generate and therefore inform our public policy in one way or the other you know, could be so very faulty. Uh, the census, I can tell you, it, it provides us data right up to the village level. We, we have over six lakh villages in our country. We can disaggregate it at the village level and the village population could also be disaggregated by communities not caste communities, but as per the statutory categories are concerned between and among the scheduled caste and the scheduled tribes and the non-scheduled population. Such detailed information on employment, on the conditions of working population, that means how many people in which age group are working or all those who are seeking work, all this information is available. But, you know, not much of it is used precisely because, you know, we tend to be carried away by the aggregate level analysis. And the aggregate level analysis generally ends at the, at the state level, the district level information and the sub-district level information being there in the census have not been adequately captured. We are also, I mean, this is also an occasion for, for me to, in fact, put forward the general impression that people tend to have, I mean, especially among the, among the researchers also, among academics also, that, you know, uh, a PhD is not worth if it is not, uh, if it doesn't uh, rely upon or it doesn't have 
uh, the primary data. So the secondary versus the primary kind of a situation is always uh, put forward. Uh, my submission here is that uh, secondary data that is generated by different departments of the government, by various agencies of the government, such as the Census of India, which is a census, complete census, everybody is counted. Some of you might raise the question, okay, in 2011 census, you know, my house was not visited. There can be errors, but you know, the error factor, in spite of the fact that, you know, you have such a huge coverage of the census operation, where every house is listed and numbered, you could see it on the at the entrance of your house that there is a particular kind of a P upon something, you know, which is a number which is which is which is already posted, you know, uh, in front of your door, um, and if you see that, that is what that is how the house listing takes place. Now with uh, modern technology, with the ICT being there, with geo uh, referencing and uh, uh, facilities being there. We can perhaps, you know, map each and every establishment, each and every house built a structure uh, and so on and so forth, whether used for commercial purposes or used for residential purposes. And this entire data set is available with, 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 with the census department, which is, um, uh, which is headed by the census commissioner and registrar general of India, which is a very, very responsible position from where, you know, much of, the data comes. But this is uh, not only that the census collects data on different aspects of it and they generate so many tables. In fact, if I were to perhaps list out just the, uh, the series, then there are at least about half a dozen or more series that they bring out from the migration table to the fertility tables, to the language tables, to the DCH, to the primary census abstract, the district um, uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, uh, this is census handbooks and so on and so forth. Uh, the population um, abstract for the scheduled caste and the scheduled tribes. Uh, but this movement towards you know the data, uh, secondary data, also enables us to in fact reduce the margin of error when you have such a huge size of data generated, then the error factor is, is so very minimal. One can say, well, you know, there are not thousand, but there could be thousand one or thousand ten people, but the numbers could be somewhere in the region where perhaps, you know, the census has predicted or census has arrived at a certain figure. They not only visit, visit households, they also, in fact, on a certain day, they, 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 the census enumerators visit uh, people who are in the, those who are squatting in the streets, those who are traveling in the trains, those who are traveling um, and they are found at the airports and so on and so forth. So all these are in fact collated into generating this kind of a data, which in fact is extremely reliable. I can tell you, you know, since we work at the village level, we, gener we go and uh, we first generate this kind of data and go to the villages. We see that there is, if we, if we are going in 2011, in fact, the match is much better. If we go in 2015, you know, we'll have to estimate and the estimator works out to be fairly good. Not only that, the census data is very important to in fact help these sample surveys to happen. Say for example, the, the NSSO data or the PLFS data or the data which in fact is generated by the NFHS, that is National Family Health Surveys, which in fact is one of the, one of the, one of the uh, very important uh, data that we have started generating since 1992, 93 which informs us about the health conditions, about the reproductive and child health, about various other dimensions of, of, uh, of uh, a woman's life, because you know, the women tend to be the center of uh, uh, the family health service, because it was 
Um, it began as a kind of an input in, 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 in areas of reproductive health, precisely because you know, we were not in a position to, in fact, take care of maternal mortality and infant uh, mortality rates, which were extremely high during the 70s, 80s, and 90s. Ever since we have had these rounds, you know, there have been very useful kind of interventions which have been made, uh, both at the, uh, by the government, by launching various kinds of programs, Janani Suraksha and so on and so forth. All these have come precisely because you know, we had access to NFHS data or the RCH data at the, at the district level. The RCH is reproductive and child health data, which in fact is also generated by the IIPS uh, on behalf of the government of India um, on, uh, to inform district level situations, which is identical to that of the NFHS. I request uh, uh, those who are present to perhaps, you know, all these are available. They have their sites. You know, you can download, you can see the reports, you can really see as what is the range of information that, that all these different sources are providing us. But if one were to perhaps, if NSS were to carry out its exercises, if PLFS have to carry out its exercises, if NFHS has to carry out exercises, all these sample designs or the sample survey and their survey designs entirely depend upon the census enumeration units. If the census enumeration units are not there and there is no information which is available for on the census enumeration units, we cannot perhaps estimate the samples that we have to generate. So therefore, you know, there's going to be, I mean, we are going to really based on 2011 data. If 2021 doesn't happen, sooner or later, it would happen, say, if at all, if it happens, it will happen after two, 2024 or 2025. And by the time it comes, you know, the next round, that is 31 census would be due. So in all probability, we are going to have only 31. And we are not going to have 2021 um, censuses at all. Uh, we lost it because of the COVID, but, you know, since COVID uh, cannot be taken to be an excuse, uh, there are many countries, you know, they conduct their surveys, the censuses five yearly. We do it um, uh, after every 10 years, precisely because it's a lot of money which is spent, it's a lot of human resources which is also put into and that's not possible if one would perhaps do it for a country of the size of India and population of the size of India every five years. But then nevertheless, you know, the census enumeration is very, very important to inform and help these sample surveys. Now, there are various kinds of sample surveys which one can talk about. Say, for example, you know, uh, there are sample surveys, you know, which are also carried out by different departments, um, such as, you know, uh, there is an agricultural situation or labor, rural labor inquiry. These are all sample surveys. Now, what would happen to these sample surveys if we do not have proper information uh, from the census? Because census data, the census figure is taken to be the reference on which, you know, the sample sizes are therefore determined. And the primary census sample units are also determined on the basis of the census data. So that is there is going to be a tremendous loss, uh, 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 and the probability of error is going to be much larger if one were to perhaps you know uh, not have uh, the the census. Uh, there are other sources also. Say, for example, I talked about health, and I talked about. Uh, reproductive health, but the NFHS also covers women empowerment, which is extremely important uh, topic um, uh, of research, uh, where you know various parameters of women empowerment is taken into consideration. And this data is generated through the sample of nearly about 7.2 lakh women in the reproductive age group, both from the rural and urban areas until about NFHS 3, you know, only women were 
the respondents, but four and five, we have had five surveys so far, and if it is rounds, uh, men uh, are also included. After all, men also contribute in the reproductive uh, scenario, and therefore men's men's role is also very important. And therefore, you know what we see that you know there there are domestic violence uh, kind of information is also made available, and it's very rich. Now with the fourth and the fifth one. Um, we have uh, data right. We have estimator on some of these important indicators right up to the district level. Although the size of the district uh, sample may be smaller, it is still much larger than any individual carrying out a primary survey. So therefore, you know, uh, 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 this kind of a, a dualism that we generally tend to posit. Uh, between the secondary data and the primary data, primary data being more important, more more authentic, where you where you are in a position to uh, interview your respondents face to face, which has its own advantages, but it can never entirely replace the coverage of the secondary data sources. Maybe the secondary data sources are also based on sample, but the sample size there at a certain level is extremely rich, large, and with minimum of error that one could perhaps find. There are questions which are raised from the sample surveys, particularly in case of, in, in the context of representations. When it comes to say, for example, you know, estimating certain kinds of uh, uh, indicators for the scheduled tribes, uh, we find that, you know, since they are not ubiquitous, they tend to be concentrated in certain pockets of India. You know, their representation is, uh, uh, tends to vary. So when we are making an estimate, say, for example, in Bihar for the scheduled tribes, you know, it, it tends to be extremely unreliable. But when it comes to Jharkhand, you know, you know, it's far more reliable than perhaps it is for the rest of Bihar. I'm talking about the rest of Bihar and Jharkhand in the older frame when the, uh, the two were part and parcel of the same state. Uh, similarly, you know, when we, when, when we were to perhaps, you know, look at say, some kind of an estimates for uh, the Muslim population of certain religious communities, then, you know, their representativeness becomes a little questionable. But at the aggregate level, you know, uh, and looking at the size <laughs> of the religious communities, you know, uh, the secondary data sources are very, very useful. Um, but does it mean that, you know, I am saying that the primary data sources, the primary survey should be avoided? No. You know, the, the, the advantage of data is to, in fact, at three levels, should be seen at three levels. One is where you have the census and the kind of data that the census generates. So the census kind of service generate. Say for example, it is not only census, the demographic census, you know, population census that I'm talking about. I'm also talking about say the periodic agricultural census. Now, if you want to look at as to what is the production scenario in agriculture, we have had 20 such rounds of agricultural censuses. Again, after 2013, 14, there is no agriculture census, but during this particular period, you know, we should have perhaps, you know, expected two more agricultural censuses. Uh, we have livestock census, other than the economic census that I've already talked about. So for different, and of course the census, which, which in fact is carried out for the industries, the annual, annual, annual survey of industries, and all these, at one level of aggregation provides us a fairly good amount of information, which should be then matched and related to the sense, the sample surveys, and the sample survey can further inform the primary survey. So therefore they are not, they, they should be supplemented rather than they should be seen as, you know, one being better than the other. What are the kinds of data that we should tend to, we should rather be inclined to generate through our primary survey? Uh, 
you know, we have we have uh, um, in India, you know, we have had two rounds of uh, ISDS, that is uh, Human Development Surveys. 2011 was the last. Now, what they did was that they found, okay, that the, the census gives us some kind of a disaggregated picture for the scheduled caste, for the scheduled tribes, but it doesn't tell us much about, you know, what are the non-scheduled communities. So they added some questions. So some sample surveys, like the NSSO, because the census doesn't provide any data on income. Uh, it does provide data on assets, but it doesn't, it can't really provide data on income. Nobody gives you the correct data on income. Similarly, you know, if you look at the NSSO, it doesn't generate data on income. But what it does, it is much easier or relatively easier for us for this for the sample for the sample survey to develop questionnaire and generate data on expenditure. So what you have, you may not have income data, but you have something as a surrogate that is an expenditure. What is the expenditure category or the per capita monthly expenditure? Uh, in which various households uh, put in. So you have, you have the you have the statutory communities or statutory uh, scheduled communities which are also being uh, covered. And within each, you know, one could also look at the expenditure classes. So you have caste, class, income, expenditure, kind of an interface which could be generated, and it, it gives us enormous insight into into uh, uh, say some of the parameters which, for which you know, one would like to generate data. Uh, I would take up one important uh, uh, example, and that is on education, because education is the area that I work on, particularly on school education. Give you some brief introduction to education data. Uh, social and cultural tables of the census provides us complete information on two counts of education. One is the stock variable called educational attainment. That means, you know, you have people sitting in the, in the auditorium. Uh, all of them, they have certainly passed their plus two levels. So they're attain and they're studying currently in the undergraduate program. So you are counted at two places. One, where you have attained the last degree or the last diploma, whatever it may be, that is plus two levels. So you are counted there as completed levels of education. And then they also generate information as, as to how many of them are continuing their education. And this is very important data. You know, you get to know as to what is really the situation of enrollment at a given point of time, because you know you have the age tables uh, by sexes, by by gender. So you have how many men, how many women are in school of what age group, and you can work out the ratios to see as to whether we are closer to universal primary education or universal elementary education. If we are not, then which are the communities which are lagging behind? Uh, and if you rather uh, 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 go beyond, if you ask, wait, which are the income groups or which are the expenditure groups You know where the dropout rates are high or where attendance ratios are lower, then perhaps you, know, you go to the NSS. You know? And as NSS gives us data on a wide range of uh, educational expenditure by households, uh, attendance rates, not in, not only enrollment ratios, but also attendance ratio, because you may be admitted in a school, but you may not be attending the schools for a variety of reasons. And uh, there you find that, well, you know, what about those you know, who, who do not attend the school and why did they do not go to school? And you ask them, the census can cannot ask this kind of question because you know it's a one page schedule you know, which they have to finish on a particular day, the NSS has the freedom to do that. You know, For the reference period that they have, the last 30 days, the last 365 days, you know, they can ask this question. You know, they have 
They have the patience to, in fact, add an additional question. They have the space to do that. How much of money uh, do you spend on tuition fees and so on and so forth and other expenditure? So they not only provide information and expenditure, they provide you data on why you dropped out. But there again, you know, you have this limitation. The limitation is that and that's the limitation also with NFHS because, you know, it generated data, the latest round tells us that, you know, majority of the children drop out of schools because, you know, they are not interested in, in education, which is, which is a very funny kind of a category. I mean, to my mind, I've been working on education. I really don't understand what is this not interested in education. Why is the child not interested in education? I, if I were a child and my father was, or my parents were sending me to the school, I would rather play rather than, uh, and, uh, rather than sit in the classroom and study. So no child is willing to go to school to study. Uh, if that is the premise, then you know, one would perhaps ask as to, as to why you know, the child is not interested in, in, in education. Why, what are the experiences of the child? Uh, in school, is the child being treated well with his uh, by by his peers? What, whether the child is being taken care of by 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 uh, uh, by the class by the teachers, you know, this reminds me of a beautiful um, auto autobiography written by one of the Dalit um, authors, you know, Jutan, in which you know he talks about. His experiences during his uh, his schooling days, uh, he was never made to sit in the classroom. Rather, given a, a broom to, in fact, clean the campus, the school campus, uh, while he went, his father, his parents sent him to school uh, to study. So there can be a variety of reasons because of which the child is not interested in education, not interested in going to school. Now, this question cannot be these. Variety of questions can't be can't be asked by the sample surveys. These can be supplemented by the researcher through some kind of a primary survey. So you have data on on dropouts, but you do not have so much of elaborate information on why children drop out from the schools. Is it because the school is very far off? Why girl children drop out from when they graduate from primary to the upper primary? Why majority of them they drop out? The dropout ratio becomes suddenly shoots up for the girls. Is it because of unavailability of schooling facilities in the neighborhood? All this information becomes very, very important. Now, that is why when the planning processes started, the first step that was taken by the government was to inform educational planning through All India Educational Surveys. Unfortunately, All India Educational Surveys have been discontinued now. We have had only seven complete rounds. And uh, then after the eighth one couldn't be completed, or maybe we have very partial, very partial data available, ninth one, ninth one which was being prepared was abandoned. And it was replaced by UDIS. Initially, it was called DISE, DIS, District Information System on Education, which was started in 2001 in order to inform right to education and Sarva uh, Shiksha We all know that right to education uh, as an uh, 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 as an act was accepted only in 2009 and it was implemented in 2010 onwards. Uh, but, you know, and that was concentrated on elementary education. That is the first five years plus upper primary, that is first eight years of school education, because that is where we wanted to have compulsory enrollment for our children. Uh, so, uh, but then, you know, soon after we realized that, you know, we why not make it uh, up to up to secondary education and why not higher secondary education? So now it is U hyphen dais, U that is unified district information system and education. Now, one of the this is a very rich data. This is annually generated, and all this data is available on the website of the ministry, supplemented by all India higher education surveys. 
Now, this our so higher education data was absolutely scanty. When we were working for the 11th plan, I um, we found out that there was hardly any data on colleges. There was hardly any data on universities. Uh, one could only count the numbers of number of universities, but certainly counting of the colleges was also very difficult. Uh, because you know there was no data set available either with the UGC or with the ministry. The ministry publishes publishes a, a, a volume annually called Education in India, which was uh, a kind of which was designed after the colonial uh, British government education in India in India, which was a quinquennial report on education, which was far elaborate. But then this was uh, this was also very important. Which tell, told us as to uh, which tells us as to what is the kind of flow, how children move from one stage of education to another, but higher education data was absolutely not reliable. Uh, it's good that you know from 2011, you know we have the All India Education Higher Education Service, and uh, in fact the compliance is extremely good. Uh, we have the number of colleges which are which have been enrolled, both private and public. Uh, and uh, or various other kinds of um, bodies which are running these educational institutions at the school level and at the university level, at the college level, you know, there is a, 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 a good number of, a good amount of compliance. In fact, according to the report, the compliance is close, close to about 92 to 94% in different years. It varies, but there is good data. But what is missing you know, from this? is the fact that while the census uh, social and cultural tables gives us access to the age factor, the U dias gives us whole range of information, but doesn't give us the age composition of the population. It gives us data for at the school level, it gives us data at the cluster level, it gives us data at, at every smaller level that one could perhaps think of on various parameters of his school education. In fact, the parameters are close to about 40 to 50. But it doesn't give us the basic data. And that basic data is the age data. If you do not have the age composition, which is not difficult for the U dias to collate, because if the school is the unit from where you know, they collect the data, the school is also situated in a certain context, in rural areas, in the villages, in urban areas, in certain pockets. And you know, this data can be generated. If school catchment can be worked out, now we have got fairly good amount of uh, tools and techniques to work out as to where from children come to a certain school uh, with the school code location codes being available. One can use it uh, using the GIS to in fact see as to where children are going from which locality to which particular school. Even in urban areas, one can, one can see as to what is the commutation and so on and so forth. We have worked, one of my students worked on school commutation, both in Delhi and also in Bangalore. And we were in a position to map that out in a very, very neat manner with certain sample schools that we were in a, we were in a position to take up uh, because it was not possible for an individual to in fact have the entire city being covered. But that was an uh, uh, that was an exercise which tells to informed us that you know there is uh, there's a lot of possibilities uh, and the critical data if they are found missing then all other data becomes all other sets of information which in fact is made available from secondary data sources they become at best you know only a kind of a decorative elements, you know, they, are, they really doesn't uh, provide us the basic information. If we do not know as to what is the, what is the enrollment ratios, the net enrollment ratios, or the gross enrollment ratios, or the age-specific enrollment ratio, or the attendance ratios, and the dropout, then how are we going to really inform our public policy? What kind of interventions uh, are required, therefore. Uh, in this context, I would like to end up with uh, a very small reference 
to the new education, then not the new, but uh, but the national education policy, NEP 2020. Uh, I, 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 I request, uh, I, I think most of us may have people sitting in the audience must have also read uh, the 64 page document, uh, the national education policy. Um, it is hailed by uh, certain quarters to be an extremely useful document. Uh, perhaps you know it's going to be a game changer and things of that sort. Maybe it is. And but my take here is on two counts. One is what is the basis when the national education policy 2020 suggests that you know there will be rationalization of the schools. And they will be converted into school clusters. Now, I did this exercise in order to see as to what is going to be the consequence of this. Part of that was, I've been published already in two different magazines. And the third one is coming in a, uh, in a week's time, perhaps. Where I have been in a position to see that, you know, if one were to perhaps look at the India settlement pattern, then 34% of India's rural settlements are of such size where the composition of the population would be such that children under 14 years of age would be close to about 24%, varying from 20 to 24%, but if the village size is very small, Say, for example, in the hilly areas, in the desert areas, in the tribal areas, in the forested tracts, then you find that you know these, these are the localities where school rationalization, that is, closing down the schools if the number of children is much lower than the than what is considered to be an economic proposition by the government, that is 30 or low would lead to, in fact, disadvantages created for certain groups of people, children of the tribes living in the forest, children of other marginalized communities, those who have affordability can send their children, they can make their children travel in urban areas. The average travel time is close to about 45 minutes to an hour between home and school. And that is for the first eight years in Delhi, it is. Uh, in Bangalore, it is close to about 20 to 20, 30 minutes. So if we look at the school commutation time and the distance, then how and with what kind of information one could perhaps close down schools where the size of children, the size of prospective children who could perhaps be attending schools it, is going to be small. But even here, there is a catch. Because if the number of students in a particular school is less than a certain kind of a threshold, which the government decides, and the state governments are free to decide it in their own ways, that there is no compulsion by the central government. And since you know they are the ones who, who foot the bill for, for schools, for the teacher's salary and everything, because the state governments are the ones who will spend more than the central government, then they would be inclined to, in fact, take advantage of this provision in the in the in the in the in the uh, in the report of the national education policy, and close down certain schools and provide them with some kind of a transport or transport allowance. I have seen it in certain parts of Himachal and Uttarakhand, and especially in the hilly areas, that it started with a mandatory transport being provided, which, in fact, uh, recently have been withdrawn. Now you would say that it has been just three years that the that the policy came in, and it's too quick for me to jump on this conclusion. But uh, let me tell you that a school rationalization program was started by by the Niti Aayog way back in 2014-16, and in phases uh, it started unfolding different parts of India. And that was a project kind of a base of uh, a project-oriented kind of 
work. Uh, but finally, uh, in 17, during 17 to 2020, we really saw nearly a few thousand schools being closed down, primary schools being closed down in India. And this really added to the dropouts, which one could perhaps see during the during the COVID times, you know, there is a beautiful work, you know, which a survey, which was carried out by by some people. It's about locked out. Uh, so there were schools were not only closed, but you know, children were locked out of education. So uh, that uh, uh, is also visible in the recent NFHS, where one can see that the school attendance ratios have dropped both at the at the at the primary and at the upper primary level and particularly at the upper primary level there is a serious dropout uh, serious drop from 82 to in fact uh, 67 or 71 percent at the at the all india level but at the at the at the disaggregated level you know you see you now lots of variation so uh, so when we look at this kind of a policy and its consequences then um, then it appears that you know we are we are we are getting carried away by by a certain kind of a notion, or that the politicians or the bureaucrats have, or it is being informed by by data by hard data, which in fact uh, should have been used. And there is no there is no dearth of information available. Unfortunately, you know it is not being used by. Uh, by either by the government or the governmental uh, government agencies, uh, much of and uh, the the national education policy doesn't have references to research work. I mean, unfortunately, uh, they are quoting passages from here and there, but the, it doesn't really seem to be based on any kind of facts uh, on the ground. Uh, so, uh, my request at the end would be that. You know, we should, a uh, uh, university like CREA should, in fact, uh, start some kind of a course on, on data, uh, on the understanding of secondary data. Uh, in JNU, uh, we offer a course uh, called Social Indicators of Development. And this was a full one semester course and only looking at the social indicators, that means, you know, education and health and several other parameters. Uh, which are of social kind and cultural indicators, leaving aside the economic indicators, not that they were not important. Uh, the interface between, between the economic and the social indicators uh, is very, very enormous. And that also we tried building in. It took nearly full one course. And in one uh, single lecture, it's very difficult to, in fact, capture everything. But I have taken these examples in order to, uh, in order to put my point before you and submit before you that uh, uh, a course of this nature, which would perhaps inform students at various levels as to how to in fact understand data. Uh, the data is not simply to be seen and taken at the face value. They are guided by definitions. And that's the last point which I would like to take. The definitional properties of Every concept used in uh, the census enumeration or in NSS are to be first of all studied. And um, uh, when we say, say for example, when we say literacy, and if you want to, to perhaps look at the literacy figure of 1971 and compare it with 2001, the literates, the, 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 the term used there is literates, but in fact, you know, the definition undergoes a change. When we say use the term work in population, or we define workers, then you know workers were defined differently in 1971 than they were defined by the census after 1991. So therefore, you know the the uh, the uh, the definitions which in fact different agencies use, and they are more or less consistent with one another. But nevertheless, you know when say for example when we when we have the workers population marginal and main workers, then census category looks fine. You know, if people are working for more than 185 days, you know, 183 days, six months or more, they are main workers. If they work for less than six uh, six months, they are marginal workers. 
uh, what it really means to women workers, working population. How does it impact? This definition may impact women working population, and it does. But at the same time, when we look at the NSSO, they use the same working def workers definition, but they now use yet another category called the principal work and the subsidiary work. They you bring in the daily uh, work profile to a usual uh, status, to a weekly status, to a daily status. Now, all these have their relevance in a particular context. And if and, and therefore, training in these definitional properties uh, is very important. Similarly, with the migration, what does the duration or residence and uh, destination all these really mean to to uh, uh, to a researcher uh, or to somebody who's perhaps reading an article or maybe a chapter on migration uh, written by somebody. So therefore, you know, uh, uh, understanding of the data uh, through the conceptual tools that have been employed there or the definitions which have been employed by various agencies is very, very important. And that is itself a task which in fact needs to be taken before we could perhaps introduce various kinds of uh, um, uh, a course on the data sources and their utilization. Uh, at the end, I would say thank you very much for your patient hearing. I have taken more than uh, the uh, 45 minutes that was allocated to me. And uh, I would certainly be happy to respond to your questions, observations, and so on and so forth. Thank you, Vishnu. Thank you, Priya. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. Thank you, Professor Zina. Um, I think uh, this, this has been a really rich introduction to data. And uh, uh, what I'd like to do now is uh, request Professor Mahapatra to actually uh, speak and then uh, order it. Yeah, thank you, uh, Sachi, for this uh, wonderful talk. I think uh, uh, there is absolutely no doubt that, that Kriya and me. Uh, here we are trying to create a data science program, but I think it's very important for us to actually create an equivalent of a socio-economic data understanding and understanding of the infrastructure of the data and the, and the theoretical background, what we call definitional uh, background of data collection and, and interpretation and so on. There is absolutely no doubt. I think it's one important institutional point that I want to take from this. It's actually to think of maybe one or two courses, which will actually uh, introduce our young uh, minds uh, this world of data. That's something which is very important. I have a couple of uh, questions for you, uh, particularly at this political conjuncture, when the sanctity of data, you know, there was a time when Scholars interpreted the data. Can you close? Can you speak closer to the mic? Uh, because you know, there is a bit of echoing, but uh, and yeah. Sachi, can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah. Closer to the mic. Yeah, I'm, I'm very close to the mic. But, uh, yeah. Okay. So what I'm saying is that today, uh, there was a time when data was seen at least the data that government institutions generated uh, was seen as as a lab group uh, and, and, and so on, people, of course, their interpretations vary. But today, we are in a situation where uh, the data world is itself not, if the data is going against uh, the government's policy or, or something that you expect to see, then you, you are not really interested in that data. You, you want to, you want to I just see that this data is, uh, I mean, this, this is this is something of a very new thing that you find. Earlier, at least, you didn't, you questioned the data on the estimate basis, but you didn't, you didn't question the data thinking that this is wrong data or this is motivating data. That's the one. There, 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 the entire atmosphere for understanding social and economic data is actually changing in India. And, and, and therefore, it is 
very important to understand how to go about it. Second, there is in the world of public policy and uh, citizen interface, because after all, we, uh, we are in the university, we want uh, data, to, we want to look at the data and stuff like that. But it's also important that how a university becomes an institutional site where we actually generate or interpret the data, break down the data for greater citizen activism. So if maybe the researchers, we, we, we interpret the data, it's also a responsibility to, to, to take this data into, into, into the citizens. And, 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 and it's at that level that the data actually, uh, the data, all kinds of data become very quite uh, alive. They become alive, they become point of critique. And, and things like that. For example, if you just look at the gross enrollment ratio that you in higher education, let's say, and it may be 25 or 27 or 21 in the 20s. But if you if government, that number doesn't look very good. The government started playing around with by saying eligibility enrollment ratio, meaning that the students who have only passed the higher secondary, it is again that number that you produce a percentage of it. It depends on what you want to say. It depends on what you want to say that these many young people are not able to come to the higher education. That's the point you want to make. Cross enrollment ratio, there is absolutely no problem with that. But if you want to really say something else, then you put in the eligibility enrollment ratio and so on. Similarly, you know very well, better than me, about the definitional issues about towns, whether it's a census town, where the statutory town, all kinds of definitional issues which are actually making it very difficult to compare. But there are all kinds, also the issues of this need to change few things because now they're small towns, villages are, you know, congruent villages are now, this picture is a very lot of interesting, uh, our urban data is therefore, you know, sometimes people say that it's way down by our definitional issues, but, but they're also very important. Uh, point to make. I think we, uh, what I want to say finally is that uh, the, every university, according to me, as a part, part of our civic responsibility, must use enough uh, you know, courses, but also outreach. It's our responsibility to, to do an outreach on, on uh, social and economic data and, and present it in a way that in beneficial to the communities uh, uh, all around. I don't know, that's my submission. In, 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 and, and I'm sure that you may agree with that, that this is end of the day is where the data must go as well. Yeah, uh, I mean, I agree with you. I mean, there are, uh, see, all one thing that you said was that, you know, the, the government or the government in power. I mean, this is a very interesting situation that we are in, uh, especially in the last 10 years where uh, the government is uh, almost uh, rejecting everything that in fact comes when it uh, when uh, some, some of their policy is particularly on hunger. Uh, you know, the, uh, when there was a debate opened up on hunger index, you know, uh, we ended up criticizing, we may be right in criticizing the index. Uh, but uh, you know, one should be absolutely fair to uh, uh, to the uh, to the agency, which in fact has created. It is not a country-specific kind of a study. This is a study which is done internationally for about 125 countries, and it depends upon as to what is the data and the quality of data which in fact is being generated by uh, those countries. So, I think you know wherever it is found to be reasonably good. Say, for example, you know, that is also true of, uh, say, the Human Development Index. Uh, you know, we, 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 we don't have income, but we have the purchasing power parity. Uh, uh, we estimate life expectancy at birth, which is, again, a sample kind of uh, an exercise done by the Vital Statistics Agency, or SRS, a sample registration system. Uh, one can doubt the reliability of, this, uh, of the system. Uh, but you know, if we go by uh, the process and the and the 
I mean, uh, the kind of uh, effort which is made and the processes which are put in place, we, I can tell you, I mean, I was amazed to find that the NSS data of on education in 1920, uh, in 20, 2020, no, 19, uh, I can tell you that, it was 2010 was matching the, uh, I mean, it matched almost point by, with a few percentage point differences after the decimals, the, on all accounts of education, the data matched between the NSS, which was 2010 and 2011 census data. That, informs us that you know the the due diligence was there the uh, there can be uh, minor differences here and there but more or less you know the data was absolutely on the dot because the two which were carried out separately one at the sample level and one at the census level the the figures matched enormously uh so uh, you know, when we are interpreting data and uh, extending it to, to uh, say, also activism and so on and so forth, which is bound to be there. I mean, if every educated society and a vibrant society, civil society will always look at as to what is the outcome of the public policy and it would generate certain kind of activism, which I think is for the, for the interest of democracy, uh, and you know, you yourself were part and parcel of uh, a very good exercise that you people carried out at one point of time that was in social capital. I remember being part and parcel of it initially. Uh, and with all the limitations that, uh, that the concept may have had, one could be critical of several aspects of it, but then critical being critical doesn't mean that we are rejecting it. Um, uh, lock, stock, stock and barrel, but that criticism helped us in the second round, in the third round, when we again revisit with the same concept. So that is how the data matures. That data collection becomes better. Now we have seen that the data collection uh, during the during the British period and the post-independence period, you know, there has been several reforms, you know, which were brought about both in the concept conceptual tools. And so on and so forth. So uh, uh, on education also, I mean, uh, it is not the, it is just enrollment basically means, you know, not passing uh, a certain kind of a class, but what are, what are the number of people who, what are the children, uh, the number of children who are currently studying in which particular class? Now, I, I do understand that, you know, there can be gaps between enrollment and schools, they do not remove the names for a variety of reasons because they are institutionally also questioned if children drop out. So they don't want to come in uh, in the focus and they keep the name of the children and they sometimes also promote them to the next class. But that's far from reality. But that is where, you know, one can, one can, one can really see the relevance of say, the student's tracking program. Uh, in Urisa, I'm told that the student tracking program has done pretty good, um, where, you know, the child moving out from, I mean, I was part and parcel for a small group of people who are working on school tracking program in some of the districts of Urisa. And we found out that, you know, uh, if the child moved out from one school or moved from one village to another, maybe moved from village to the urban area, the child was being tracked as to whether the child has again enrolled or not, and so on. So, so that that's that's the information that I think you know we need to generate in order to help the education sector, you know, plan its uh, policies. Um, there are there will be gaps, and you know we should try to in fact fill up all these gaps. No data set is completely uh, um, free of. Uh, uh, error and uh, but you know it's better that we learn to appreciate and understand it rather completely rule it out i mean that's that's where the danger is uh, with <clears throat> Sachi, there are some more questions yeah 
why not you take some more questions from the right, 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 yeah, right, yeah. Um, thank you, hello, sir. Uh, thank you for this very insightful talk. I'm a PhD scholar here at Pia University. Uh, can you hear me, sir? Uh, yeah, yeah, I can hear you. I can hear you. Just speak closer yeah. to the mic. Since you are sitting in a hall, so yeah. uh, so the voice tends to echo. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I'm uh, a PhD scholar here at Korea University. Uh, so I'm the second part of the group you mentioned before that uh, studying, researching on the uh, secondary data. Uh, so I'm studying the Asian inequality in India. And one of the problems I faced was the lack of secondary data. Uh, uh, at, at village level. So we have uh, district level data and we have NSS region level data. We don't have data on the village level. I just wanted to mention that. I'll come to my question, uh, which is related to PLFS data, which you also mentioned. So uh, the reason in PLFS iteration, it showed that there is an, uh, a significant decrease in the unemployment rate, right? And yeah. uh, there has been uh, the paper which has been uh, recently uh, came out. They have contradictory uh, results uh, based on the PLFS uh, data. Uh, also, uh, the um, unemployment rate uh, was not really consistent uh, uh, when you are comparing with uh, previous uh, consumer expenditure data also. So what, what is your take on this? Uh, also, I would like to add uh, uh, the uh, economic census, uh, cost census data survey uh, in Bihar, right? So do you think uh, there is any political pressure uh, maybe to suppress such effort or political pressure uh, to bring out a specific narrative using, using this data? Uh, also, sir, what is your opinion about uh, using um, you know nightlight data instead of relying on uh, such instead of relying on such uh, survey data? Uh, what is your opinion about nightlight data, which are uh, not does not have that uh, you know biases coming from the surveys? Thank you. Which data you were talking about? What were you using instead of survey data? Which uh, I didn't get that clearly. Nightlight data, sir. Nightlight data. So the, there was a couple of uh, the studies being from 2013 so onwards, I think there was even before that, that uh, nightlight data can be used as a proxy for economic development. So yeah, so that is available at uh, a village level. So we can measure the economic development at village level. So instead of, so since we have, for example, we don't have, you know, poverty data uh, at village level, we have to rely on, you know, uh, uh, district level or NSS region level. Yeah, I mean, you are right that, you know, from the NSS, you cannot really estimate village level poverty because, you know, the sample size becomes extremely uh, small and not all villages are covered. Uh, but uh, if you were to perhaps look at uh, not everything that you want from uh, at the village level is available. Uh, but as I said that you have, if you have taken a look at the DCS, that is the district census handbooks, uh, there is something called village directory and town directory. Uh, if you go into the village directory, you will find that every single uh, uh, panchayat, uh, panchayat being the unit uh, for, for the data presentation, is covered uh, on several parameters, particularly on questions of, an, of amenities, uh, on questions of assets. And so there is a lot of data. So if we do not have the income data or maybe expenditure data uh, to estimate, say, for example, use surrogate variables for estimating poverty and so on and so forth, and if it just talks about wealth uh, index, uh, so one could perhaps define the wealth index using the census data and generate some kind of a wealth index for the villages. So that's not very difficult. But then, you know, uh, if we were asking as to how do we classify households at the village level, now there one has to perhaps do your own fill. As I said, um, you know, there uh, at the household level, NSS region is the appropriate unit at which it can be generated uh, uh, and not lower than that. Uh, any other surrogate indicator of poverty or 
I have absolutely no problem accepting that, provided, you know, uh, uh, there is, uh, I mean, uh, there is a sound theoretical and uh, and uh, uh, basis to, in fact, associate the two. Uh, say, for example, you know, when when the first estimate on PQLI started, you know, that was physical quality of life index. It occurred. It was carried out in mid seventies by one Mr. Morris D. Morris and McAlpin in the context of India. Uh, he did not use uh, life expectancy at birth. And uh, 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 he used instead life expectancy at age one. Uh, and there was a lot of criticism. Uh, we know that HDI uses life expectancy at birth. So the two differ on this, but McAlpin's measurement of PQLI is the one which in fact has been taken by by uh, the by by the HDI that is the Human Development Index more or less it is the same thing uh, even the uh, formula remains the same uh, largely uh, the argument given by uh, Mr Morris D Morris was that uh, well you know uh, because of uh, widespread infant mortality rate in the country uh, in the context of India. Uh, we hardly see much of a variation and therefore if there's not much of variation, taking life expectancy at birth as a measure of physical quality of life index is not appropriate. He had a point. And why, when he took age one, he says, you know, much of a stability sets in by age one and therefore the survival of the child is better after age one and then there is a lot of variation. So when a data has variability, then you know it is easier for uh, any exercise or any such exercise to in fact give us meaningful outcomes. If the data remains, say for example, in uh, now what has happened is that uh, uh, Professor Vishnu would understand this because uh, you know when the JNU admission policy uh, decides you know giving reservation to SCST had taken in certain other uh, parameters, say, for example, um, uh, women's uh, uh, literacy rate uh, as a proxy to understanding the conditions of women. Again, the argument was that if women remain uh, illiterate, then, you know, the household also tends to suffer, and there's enormous amount of indication to that effect that has multi uh, multi-dimensional impact Similarly, you know, we instead of taking income, we took productivity from agriculture. We saw work participation rate as one of the uh, one of the important indicators of what kind of a structural transformation that is, that economy is undergoing. And we generated this data, and we used this data in order to have what we call educationally, or maybe what we call is the backward areas, a uh, backward districts. Uh, well, uh, you know, uh, th that was going all right, but then over the years, it was felt that, you know, this indicator was not, uh, these indicators had become, I mean, they were losing their meaning, so they needed to be replaced by others. So what was done was recently that, you know, they took access to drinking water, which is itself an important indicator, um, access to toilet facilities, now you know the controversy that uh, the government was it was uh, already in when when it came to access to toilet facilities because they had already uh, declared several districts and several states as open defecation free and all that and that was the controversy with the NFHS because of which the director had to finally quit uh, the IAPS director. I mean this is not in the public domain, but uh, uh, certainly you know we know the controversy initially. He had to go and leave, and so on and so forth, and finally he had to leave. That is where there was a. There can be differences of opinion between between the government, its stated policies, and the outcome, the way the government and the bureaucracy saw it. But if it is not getting revealed from the data, then that is that that should be in fact taken into consideration rather than, you know, uh, outrightly reject the data. So any kind of a surrogate variable or 
any other sets of indicators like you know government is now proposing or has already proposed multidimensional poverty index of poverty which i think uh, is meaningful but uh, uh, it can also be seen that you know there is a possibility to improving it uh, this cannot outrightly re uh, uh, re i mean uh, replace the poverty index i mean you have to estimate poverty i mean that exercise must go on uh, whether the government is interested or not i mean you can replace it with multi dimensional we all understand that if you have lower income you know you have uh, you know you have lower nutritional intake lower nutritional nutritional intake means you know the children could be frequently falling ill and they could be also likely to be dropping out and so on and so forth so it's a kind of a circular and cumulative position uh, but that has its own advantages but estimating poverty has is a very very different kind of an policy uh, uh, data which in fact um, the government would would nevertheless have i mean to the extent i could hear you clearly this is our world that i wanted to share much of it was lost because of because of a lot of echo uh, at my end have i answered your question yes sir Yes, sir. Thank you. Is there anybody else? Any other questions? No, I think. Uh, yeah, I think you 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 sort of got us thinking, and I think we learned a lot from the. From everything that you've told us, and as Vishnu said, I think it, it really brings home to us that we should develop courses that uh, really allow us to have a much deeper understanding of data, and as well as the data definitions, their implications. Uh, because I think we tend to uh, jump very quickly to the politics of data, but don't spend enough time on the data itself and what it can teach us. Uh, I think that's been my my experience at least of teaching uh, in the social studies programs. You know, we're very quick to think of surveillance. We think quick to think of the politics of data, but we don't really deal with the data itself and what it represents and the complexities. Both, as you have pointed out, the possibilities and the limitations and the kind of uh, you know contradictions that can uh, come and the very real implications of data sets. So I think this was really, really useful. Um, so I'm going to, you know, we, we hope to keep this conversation going with you over time. But I'd really like to just to take this opportunity to thank you for agreeing on very short notice. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much.